in your comments, you talk about the quarter being one in which Dow showed its resilience. What do you mean by that? Good morning. Uh, well, you saw in the fourth quarter, obviously, we saw the big compression in margins that happened as oil prices declined and all, also as China slowed down at the end of the year. And what I mean by resilience is that in the face of those compressed margins, our downstream businesses and our performance silicones, our polyurethane systems business and our packaging and specialty plastics business really showed strength to overcome some of that. Also, we delivered 125 million of cost savings in the quarter and the first 40 million of the stranded cost savings from the Dow DuPont separation. So we're off to a good start there. So I think all in all, the portfolio performed well and in most cases better than our peers. All right, Jim, Jim Kramer, good to see you, sir. Where are morning, we Jim. with uh, morning? Where are we with the buyback? You guys throw off a huge amount of cash. You're going to have uh, you're the large, highest yielding stock in the Dow. Uh, but I understand that you do have a lot more firepower. And when will that come to work? Yeah, Jim. So we declared a two point one billion dollar annual dividend, which makes it the largest dividend in our sector. And that was our main priority to get that out before the uh, spin out happened. But we also said we would have the capability to do share buybacks. In fact, our target is to return 65% of operating net income back to the shareholders through the cycle. We put a 10B5 in place uh, at the spin because we could not be in the open market. But because of the way the stock traded post spin and didn't move down, nothing really triggered any share repurchase during that time. So that 10B5 expires in June and we will be in the open market. And Howard Ungerleiter, my CFO, and I said on the call today, that our target is to look at at least 500 million of share buyback through the remainder of the year. All right, Jim, I know that there's a correlation with oil. I think a lot of people would say, well, wait a second, when oil goes down, doesn't Dow do better? It's actually the opposite, and oil has been going higher. At what point will people realize, geez, you know, as oil goes up, this is really a great opportunity to own a company that makes plastic, that stock goes up, even if it, maybe you think it shouldn't. I mean, the correlation really does beg to, uh, for people at home to understand. So could you try to figure that out for people? Sure. I think what's happened, obviously, is um, you can make petrochemicals from natural gas liquids. You can make them from oil. The oil-based or naphtha-based uh, assets really set the high end of the cost curve. So as oil goes up, you get a spread between naphtha and ethane, naphtha and propane, and that spread means margin for those who have advantage feedstock positions like Dow and those who have flexible feedstock positions. So as oil moves up, that actually creates spread and creates margin. But the other thing that happens is um, it's positive for the whole economy. So what we've seen right now is that the consumer demand has been strong, but maybe a little bit weak on some of the big ticket items like buying an automobile or housing starts or durable goods. And I think as you see the whole economy progress, you're going to see that those big ticket items come on. So you'll get both a demand move and a spread move from that. The other thing to remember is we brought on a lot of capacity in 2018. So there was the bulk of the polyethylene capacity in the first wave of shale gas expansion happened in 2018, about the same time that China slowed down at the end of the year. As that capacity is already online and in the market, through the back half of the year, we think that the polyethylene demand is going to outstrip any new supply. And as you move into 2020, you'll get back into more mid-cycle and more peak 2020, 2021. So some of the analysts are seeing that and they're saying, look, this is the cycle time where you would expect things to start sequentially improving. And that's what we put out in second quarter outlook. We think core earnings are going to sequentially improve. We've got a couple of turnarounds coming in the quarter, which are a little bit higher cost than first quarter. But we're starting to see pricing turn the corner in our key uh, intermediates like siloxanes, uh, MDI, and polyethylene. Jim, it's Sarah. Question on the industrial economy. I mean, you guys touch so many different industries and production. In the U.S., we're getting some mixed reads now. Weaker ISM report, better factory orders. What's your outlook? for the U.S. for the rest of the year in terms of the manufacturing sector. Morning, Sarah. I think the U.S. economy is relatively strong. 
I think there's a little bit of a drag. We saw some uh, currency headwind in the quarter. For us, it was about $100 million. So as the U.S. dollar has strengthened, that's put a little drag on exports from the U.S. Um, I'm a little more concerned with the EU. The EU has slowed down. So when China slowed down, it backed up some things into Europe like automobiles. Uh, you've got some inventory to work through both at the dealers and at the manufacturing in automobiles in Europe. And you see that pressure, obviously, in Germany. I think we'll work through that in the back half of the year. And we're starting to see some stimulus in China. I think this trade deal, we get the trade deal done this week. I think you're going to see some positive market psyche come out of that. And a couple of our value chains, you may actually see people start to make commitments and, and, and build some inventory to get ready for the back half of the year. Uh, Jim, you've got this gigantic uh, Mideast venture, uh, Sidara, and we're all, I remember when uh, Andrew Livers used to talk about this is going to be the lowest cost, greatest production field in the world, that this is going to change the game for Dow. I I'm trying to figure out where it went. I know it's there, but I'm trying to figure out why, why it doesn't matter more for your earnings. Yeah, Jim, Sidara is a, a great asset, and it's been running exceptionally well. It does have a very low variable cost, a very low cash cost of operation. It was a big project. Uh, it was a $20 billion project. And so it's got some project financing. And what we're doing with Sidara now is working through the debt and the capital structure on that project now that it's operational. When we completed the lender's reliability test last year, that gives us the ability to go back and, and talk to the lenders about doing some refinancing get it out of project financing and really get it more into an ongoing concern. And so we're working with Sidara and with our partner Aramco to get that work done in 2019. Uh, Jim, finally, it's David again. Um, you know, we, Jim and I have talked to you about this in the past, but there is a worldwide effort uh, that one would expect will only continue and pick up momentum to try to get people to use less plastic. Does that represent a headwind long term to your business? David, I don't think so. Uh, one of the reasons plastics has grown and continues to grow is because it's the most sustainable package that's out there. And it's lightweight, it's flexible, it's durable. It can be engineered to do things like make composites to replace metal and steel and glass. So I think you're not going to overcome that trend. We do have to address the waste issue. And I'm very excited about the partnership that we've got, the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. We have now more than 35 companies in the alliance. We've got it up to $1.1 billion. We're very actively moving projects through the pipeline now. Without any solicitation since the beginning of the year, we have more than 300 projects coming at us for circular economy. We're talking about even taking plastic waste and breaking it back down to the chemical molecule so that we can put it back into either an ethylene cracker or a plastics plant. We call that feedstock recycling. That would be a full loop circular economy, just like you would have with an aluminum can going back to a smelter. You're seeing a lot of activity in this space. And I think over the long term, people are going to say, we should put our effort into that versus trying to ban everything, especially things that have a very positive sustainability impact.